There's a war taking place over the control of your body. There's a war taking place over your destiny. There's an enemy that has come to steal, kill, and destroy. God has made provision for you to experience victory in every area. But in order to experience all that Christ has done for us and walk in victory in particular over the world, the flesh, and the devil, which are our real enemies, we need to know God and we need to know ourselves. We need to know who we are and how God has shaped us and positioned us for victory in the new covenant. And we told you that there are, you are a tripartite being. You have, you are a spirit being. And we told you about your spirit. Second Corinthians 5, 17, you are a new creation. I'm not going to review because I realize when I review this, it makes my sermons longer than I want them to be. But remember, you can get these messages by just going to YouTube. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, go to my YouTube channel, subscribe, because these messages are there. So go and review them. But the Spirit is born again. In other words, everything that you will find in Jesus, you will find in your spirit today because Christ is the life of your spirit. So as he is, you are. That's a revelation you need to renew your mind with. Last week, we talked to you about the body. As you, are, you, you are a spirit, but you live in a body. We talked to you about the body. and We said, contrary to what we have believed, the body is not evil. Romans 12 tells us the body is holy. The body is pleasing to God. We're told the body is the temple of the living God. The body is not evil, but there is a foreign entity called sin or the flesh that because of the fall now lives within and has access to the body and influences the body and takes the appetites of the body captive. We liken that sin to the virus that we're dealing with. And we say, listen, just like you have to take uh, precautionary measures in order to, to, to place distance between you and the virus, and you're wearing face masks, even more so, we need to realize that the sin virus is in our bodies or will attack our bodies, and we need to take measures to resist it. Amen? But this battle with sin, the world, and the devil is not a battle that involves only the spirit or the body. There's a third party you call the soul. And the soul plays an extremely important role in determining what your experiences will be on earth. Your soul is located between your spirit and your body. Amen? So if your spirit is going to influence your body or what's happening in your body, if the life and power that is in your spirit, the very life of Christ, is going to impact your body and your circumstances, your soul has a role to play. That is why in Romans chapter 12 we're told, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove or experience the perfect will of God. So the soul, the mind, the will, the emotion, someone calls it the, the, the thinker, the feeler, and the decider. The soul is an important part in this battle. And we have to learn about the nature of our soul and how God has designed the soul to function so that the soul can do what God has intends it to do in managing and controlling and directing the body and in setting the body free when the body or empowering the body or directing the body when the body is being tempted to sin. So we're going to talk to you today about the soul. Say, Spirit of God, open my mind, teach me about my soul. Hallelujah. So, the soul is the part of me that is the thinker, the feeler, the decider. You could almost call the soul the decider in chief because the soul must make decisions that will impact the body must make decisions to resist sin 
or sin will master and continue to have his way with the body. All right? Now, when God created us, Adam, man, he created us spirit, soul, and body. The spirit was supposed to lead. The soul was to follow. The body was to be a servant, basically, to express the will of the spirit and the soul. But when man sinned, the spirit died or was separated from God. Because that's what death is. Death is separation. And when man sinned, his sin was imputed to him, and that caused spiritual death to occur. So things got turned around. And instead of the spirit being in charge with the soul following and the body aligning itself, the body now started to lead. And the fallen man is controlled by the body, which is the seat of our senses. So the body now, which feels physically sees, hears these appetites, now are leading the way in terms of the decisions that are being made. That's not the way God designed it. So when Christ came, he came to restore the, the original image where the spirit is leading and the soul is cooperating and the body is following. The truth is, when you become saved, my goodness, the new creation is actually uh, superior in terms of its likeness to God than Adam. So salvation actually makes us even better. Are you following me? Than Adam was. Salvation actually makes us even more in the image of God than Adam was. Because in salvation, we are literally now one with Christ. Adam never got to the place where he was one with God. Are you hearing me? Say, Christ is my life. Amen? Now, before you got born again, this entity called sin that it lives in our body as a result of the fall was free to use your body without any opposition. It took your bodily appetites captive and your body was its slave. Before salvation, and even now, anyone who is unsaved, the body is a slave of unrighteousness. So the body actually in the unregenerate person serves sin like a slave. But after you experience salvation, say, after I got saved, after I got born again, amen, after Jesus came into my life, amen, something happened. Now that my spirit is born again and sharing the very life and nature of God, my spirit is unwilling to serve sin. Amen. And now my spirit wants to use my body for righteousness. Sin is in my members and sin is as committed as ever. The world, the flesh, and the devil are as committed as ever to use my body to express sin and unrighteousness on the earth. But now that I'm born again, my spirit partakes of the very nature of Christ. And my spirit wants to have nothing to do with sin. My spirit now wants to take this body and use it for righteousness because that's what it was designed to do. The problem is sin that is in my body is powerful. And sin resists that. The flesh resists that. So there is a battle that has taken place between my born-again spirit that wants to use my body for righteousness and the sin that is in my flesh, in my body, that wants to use my body for sin. So the question then, with sin still clinging on my body and sin still has having the ability to, cap, to, to hold my, my, my appetites captive and to use my body, and my spirit wanting to use my body for righteousness, the question is, where is the soul? I know where my, my, my spirit is, and I know my body is holy, but my body is powerless in itself. And so sin is, is, is clinging on to my body, and the question is, where is the soul, my mind, my will, my emotions, where is the soul, that middle part of me, that decider in chief? Where is the soul in this battle? 
That's a good question. And I'm going to share with you and show you that right now that the soul is on the side of your spirit. At the end of this message, I hope you realize there's no part of you, spirit, soul, or body that wants to sin. There's no part of you, spirit, soul, or body that is aligned with sin. There's a battle now, that is real and that must be fought. But your soul is aligned with your spirit against sin. Let me show you one or two scriptures to demonstrate that. Go to 1 Peter 2.11. 1 Peter 2.11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from what? Fleshly lust, which do what? War against, oh, wait a minute. So there's a war taking place. And that verse says, the lusts that are in my flesh are at war with my soul, which means my soul is not aligned with the lusts. If my soul is at war with the fleshly lusts at work in my body, then my soul is not on the side of fleshly lusts. My soul is aligned with my spirit against the fleshly lusts. Oh, you got to hear me. Say, my soul is also holy. Something happened to your soul when you got born again. Before you get saved, your soul is locked, stuck, and barrel aligned with the lust of your flesh. But something happened when you got saved. God did a work not just in my spirit. God did a work in my soul. And my mind, my will, and emotions are in fact aligned with my spirit against sin that is in my members. Let me show you another passage to, to demonstrate this. Romans chapter 7. And we're going to look very quickly at verse 21 to 25. You know there was a battle that was taking place that Paul described that was taking place in his, in his, in his life, right? Let's read about that battle. Romans chapter 7, 21 to 25. Let's read together. I find then a law that evil is present with me. The one who... Oh, wait a minute. Where is the will? The will is in the soul. He said, evil is present, but that evil is not in my soul because my soul wills to do good. Let's go on. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my, in my memory. What? That's my body. Warring against the law of my So you see the battle again? The mind is a part of the what? Soul. And he says there is a war taking place between my mind, the mind of the born-again believer, the soul of the born-again believer, and this sin that is in uh, operating in my body. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into what? Captivity to the law of sin which is in my Oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ the Lord. So then with the mind, my soul, my will, my emotions, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So do you see that again? Do you see how the mind or the soul or the will of the born-again believer, the child of God, is aligned with the law of God with righteousness. But there is a battle taking place. It's a real battle. It's a war. The Bible tells us we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, but we're wrestling with principalities and powers. The Bible tells us the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're divinely powerful for the what? Pulling down of strongholds, casting down 
than imaginations. So there's a war. And we have to take it seriously. But it's not a civil war. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. We're not fighting against ourselves. My spirit is not fighting my soul. My spirit and soul are not fighting my body. My spirit, soul, and body are fighting a real enemy called sin or the world or the flesh that has influence since the fall and wants to capture my will and make me a slave to sin. But God has done something about my spirit and God has done something about my soul. Through regeneration, my spirit is born again. And guess what? My soul is purified. Go to 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. Let's read that together. Since you have... Oh, that's past tense. That's past tense. And he's writing to the whole church. So he's not writing just to individuals. He's saying all of you believers in Christ, you have what? You have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You say there, Bishop, he said obedience. Yeah, obeying the truth. What does he mean when he says obeying the truth? He means you have obeyed the truth by believing the gospel. When you hear the gospel and you believe and you declare Jesus is Savior, Jesus is Lord, I surrender my life to Christ. Guess what? You have just obeyed the truth. And when you obey the truth, you experience regeneration in your spirit. Your spirit become new, but something happens to your soul the day you got born again. Your soul got purified. I, I expected a few more amens, or at least a few. I'm telling you, your body is born again, but I'm also telling you the good news is when you got born again, something happened in your soul as well. The Bible says the new birth purified your soul. Hallelujah. So what this means is, to use an illustration, it's a thermostat. And, and you can put the thermostat on cold or on heat. You, you can set it. And if you set it on heat, it's going to produce hot air. If you set it on cold, it's going to produce cold air. You can set the thermostat. Before a man or woman gets saved, before you got saved, your soul was set on sin. And so it, it, it went along with the sin in your body. It cooperated because it was set on sin. But when you got born again, it's as though God reached into your soul and changed the setting and switched it. Oh, you didn't hear me. He switched your soul from being set on sin and now your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, if you are in Christ, are set on righteousness, set on hold. That's why sin no longer feels good to you. That's why right now if you, if, you, if you make some sinful choices and you experience sinful emotions or you, ex uh, or you do your soul, not just your spirit. You didn't hear me. Your soul reacts and that's why you don't feel peace. Your, your soul reacts. We say, that's not mine. I don't agree with that. Uh, 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 that does not belong to me. It doesn't belong to me. That is not me and I refuse to be comfortable with that. Oh, come on, say, Bishop, Bishop. When you got saved, Jesus reached into you and he set your soul on righteousness. That's why a sinner can sin and doesn't bother him. Hey, but if you are born again, if you're a child of God, if you can sin and have peace, I would say, examine yourselves. Because when you got born again, he did something with your spirit and he also did something with your soul. Your soul is set on righteousness. That's the default position of your soul. Say hallelujah. So my soul, my spirit is born again and my soul is purified. 
So my soul is set on righteousness and in the battle against sin that is in my members, my soul stands with my spirit. Listen, you are ruined for life when it comes to sin. If you are a child of God, you are ruined for life. If you can sin and it doesn't bother you, you're not saved. Are you hearing me? But if you got no business sinning, and but yet you 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 go at, you, you yield to that flesh. If you are a child of God, there will be no peace. Are you hearing me? Come on, raise your hand. Thank God. So here's a question I want to answer quickly, and I really want to answer this quickly. So if my spirit is born again, my soul is purified, why do I still make sinful choices? Bishop, aren't you contradicting yourself? Because I know some of the thoughts that go through my mind, and I know some of the decisions I make. So how can you say my soul is purified and I'm yet experiencing the kind of thoughts and temptations and these things in my soul. Well, let me, let me, let me ask you something. Or let me show you something. Adam, before Adam sinned, was his spirit perfect? Was his soul perfect? Was his body perfect? And yet he sinned. So because I have a perfect soul doesn't mean that that soul cannot be deceived or that soul cannot be tempted what about Jesus Jesus obviously had a perfect soul yet there was a sinful thought that entered into his perfect soul. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. That was a sinful thought. Had he yielded to it, it would have been sin. Since you're the son of God, jump from this temple. Show off. That was a sinful thought that entered into his perfect mind, his perfect soul. Had he yielded to it, that would have been sin. And watch this one. Bow down and worship me, and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. Idolatry, that's a sinful thought that entered into the perfect mind of the Son of God. Now, Certainly, by no means will you say that those thoughts originated from the mind of Christ. They entered the mind, but they didn't come from the mind. Oh, my goodness. They, they entered his soul, but they did not originate from his soul. His soul, his mind, will, and emotions was not the source of those thoughts. Now, we don't have to guess where the thoughts came from because the Bible says the devil tempted him. The devil put those thoughts in his mind. But because he was wise, oh my goodness, because he had armed himself, he was able to resist the thought and make the right choice. But the thought entering his mind, though sinful, did not make his mind therefore impure. So with our perfect, purified souls, these thoughts come into our mind that are sinful. And we got to realize that did not originate in my soul. For I now have the mind of Christ. Oh my goodness. See, I have the mind of Christ. One more time. I have the mind, the will, the emotions of Christ. So when these sinful thoughts and emotions are felt or experienced in my soul, I need to realize that did not originate 
in my soul, which has been purified, it has been put there and, and, and injected there by a being that wants to deceive me. Even as he deceived Adam. I have a choice then. Do I permit myself to be deceived? Will he deceive me? And will I participate in that thought and act upon it so that it becomes sin? That's a choice you make. But, and the soul, therefore, has to be equipped to deal with these kind of thoughts that the enemy will put in there in order to get you to make the wrong choices and decisions. Adam made the wrong choice. He died spiritually. Jesus, faced with the same temptation and the same thoughts, made a different decision. And you and I are empowered in Christ to make the kind of decisions that Jesus made when he was tempted in his soul. He said, Bishop, 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 I hear what you're saying, but you know, Bishop, un unfortunately, like, like, like Adam, I, I do get deceived sometimes and I act on those thoughts. But here's the difference between you now and Adam. When Adam was deceived, and Adam acted on the thoughts that were placed in his mind by the devil, Adam's sin was charged to him. And because it was charged to him, he died spiritually. Here's the good news. Say, thank God for the blood. Say, thank God for Jesus. Oh, my God. God has fixed this thing. The game is fixed on your side. God has designed this thing so that we win. Did you hear me? I said, God has designed these things that no matter how the devil does it, which ways he takes it, God's children are going to win. Say hallelujah. So now when the enemy brings the temptation and puts a thought into our mind and we are deceived and we agree with that thought and we act upon that thought and we sin, here's the difference. The sin has been charged to Jesus. Therefore, it is not charged to us. And as a result, we do not experience spiritual death. So even though we have yielded to sin and done something stupid that could have outward consequences, it did not change my relationship with God. It was not charged to me, therefore I did not experience spiritual death. Guess what? My spirit remains born again and my soul remains purified. So then what does God want me to do? Now, since he's not going to judge me or, or, or separate himself from me or, or, or withdraw, I'm not going to experience spiritual death. What does he want me to do? He wants me to learn from that experience. Become wiser because of that experience, so that the next time the enemy come, I won't be deceived a second time. Did you hear me? So I'm going to learn the lessons I should have learned. I was deceived and made a sinful choice, but you know what? Thank God I didn't lose my salvation. Thank God my spirit didn't die. Thank God God, no, God didn't reject my spirit nor my soul. Thank God I'm still alive in Christ, and my soul is still purified. But I've learned from this. So the next time the devil comes, uh, 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 I will not be fooled or deceived a second time. And then God wants you to take the lessons you learn and help someone else with it. So Jesus says to Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But I pray for you. I pray for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, take the lessons you learn and use it to strengthen your brethren. <laughs> Say glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And so, did, did you, did you, are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. So then, there's a battle taking place, and I've just shown you that your spirit and your soul through regeneration and 
have experienced a transformation where your spirit is born again and your soul is purified and your spirit and soul are together against sin, but the battle is still real and, and sin will try to sin, the world, the flesh, the devil will try to influence your soul, deceive your soul into making wrong decisions so that you engage in sin. But thank God when you do, you don't die spiritually. You learn your lessons, you become wiser so that the next time you are not deceived again. But the war is real, and you and I have to take the war with sin seriously because that war with sin is about God's glory. That war with sin that is second place is about your destiny. That war with sin that is second place is about the life that God has designed you to live and the, 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 the experiences God has designed you to have, the abundant life God has given you in Christ Jesus. Those decisions in your soul will affect that. And so you've got to make a decision that you are going to do what? Arm your soul like Jesus did. Equip your soul like Jesus did. So that when the enemy puts these thoughts in your mind, your soul is ready. It has what it needs. Are you hearing me? To resist the enemy and to work with your spirit on behalf of your body. So, so some have likened some have likened the spirit of the soul to a computer. There are two parts of a computer. There is hardware, and then there is software. The hardware consists of all the physical components that the computer is made of, which are essential for the computer to function. But you can get a brand new computer with the best components physically, and the computer will do nothing for you unless it has software, information, and instructions. That's a, a likeness to your soul. Your soul is perfect hardware. I mean, God has designed it for righteousness. It's perfect for God's purpose. The hardware is perfect. But that hardware, the soul that is perfect, needs the right software. It needs information and instruction. And if you give it the right information and you give it the right instruction, it will do what God created it to do. And when sin rises up or temptation comes its way, the soul will be able to use that information and instructions that you've given it, the software you've uploaded or downloaded into it, to be able to resist and overcome the temptation and free your body to yield to God. You say, Bishop, Bishop, where is the software? You know where the software is. You know where it is. You know where the software is. Thy word, thy word, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. Receive with meekness a grafted word which will save your soul. You know the, the soul of the believer is, is, is built and equipped to run on the software of God's word. And if you will upload God's word, now hear me, not just anything, but the word concerning Christ. Let the word of the message concerning Christ and the message concerning Christ is the message of grace. Are you hearing me? It's the message of God's love. Hear me. When you upload and download this software into your soul and you make sure that that is the software that your soul is operating on, I am totally forgiven. I am deeply loved. I have an experience, favor, highly favored by God. And that is the word of grace that I continually upload or download and refresh my soul with. Then you're given the soul, my goodness, the information and the instructions it needs to be able to resist sin and to make the right choices that will enable the body to overcome temptations in the flesh. The problem many of us have is not with the soul, it's with the software. 
So renewing our mind is speaking about giving your soul more revelation, information. I need to do that. So Jesus armed his soul with the word of God. He had the right software running his soul. And so when the devil came and tempted him and said, do this, Jesus said, the soul said, uh, 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 boop, 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 it's written. Do this, boop, 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 it's written. So the word of God provided the information and the instructions that the soul needed to make the right decision. What are you doing with the word of God? What are you doing with the word of God? What are you doing with the word of God? It's called the sword of the spirit for a reason. But hear me, and I, I, I've, got to, I've got to share this. Jesus didn't only arm himself with the word of God. He armed himself with a willingness to suffer. I said he did what? He armed himself with a willingness to suffer. I want to end with this passage. 1 Peter 4, 1-2. 1 Peter 4, 1-2. Let's read this together. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with us. For he who has... You know what that means? If we're going to win the battle against sin, we need to download the word of God and we need to arm ourselves with a willingness to suffer for righteousness sake. What that verse means that the person who has decided, I am willing to suffer physically, physically, in my battle against sin. I, I'm, I'm willing to go without my pleasures. I'm willing to go with our privileges. I'm willing to go with our properties. I'm willing to go even if necessary with our physical life. I'm willing to suffer rather than to sin. I'm willing to be talked bad about. I'm willing to be cussed. I'm willing to be mistreated. I'm willing to go through all kinds of things. For the sake of righteousness, he says, when you arm yourself with that attitude, that I would rather die than to willingly give my body to sin. He says, then you have ceased from sin. In other words, sin's power over you will be broken. Because the reason we yield to sin so often is in order to preserve our physical lives to some degree. But when we get to a place, say, you know what? It doesn't matter. What matters is God's glory. What matters is God's will. So I arm myself with the truth of God's love and grace. But I also arm myself with a willingness. If necessary, I will lose the job. I will go without money. I will be single for the rest of my life. If that's what it takes, then God, I am willing, not my will. Your will be done. You see, when you arm yourself with that attitude, hear me, you're going to be more than a conqueror. And sin will not have dominion over you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, raise two hands to heaven and say, Father God, I thank you that my soul is aligned with righteousness. My soul is aligned with my spirit against sin. I thank you, God. There's no civil war taking place in my life. I arm myself against sin with your word and with my willingness by your grace to pay the price physically that I may have to pay in order to resist sin. In Jesus' name, the Lord gave you grace, both to will and do his pleasure. Give you the grace to suffer, if need be, for righteousness' sake. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. 
Did you receive something? Was this helpful?